All right. Welcome everyone to our third and final class of this virtual rain garden series. Thanks for putting up with us and sticking with us through all this. Um, you know, it's just been nice to see, I was saying earlier in the in the call as I was waiting, just nice to see familiar faces and, and uh, familiar names now that I've kind of been working with you and uh, all the posts on the on the Padlet. So thanks for being here. I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen and we'll get started. We'll try to get started here. One second. Okay, can everybody see that? I'm hoping looks I good. get some. Looks good. Okay, great. So welcome back, those of you that just joined. Third and final class for the Rain Garden Workshop. Thanks for being here. We have this, um, we don't have everybody new today. It's the same presenters that we had either the first class or the second class. So no new introductions. Um, it'll be, it, excuse me, it'll be Maddie and then Emily and Rick will be presenting as well. And we also have Teresa here. She's not gonna be presenting, but she's here as a resource for us. So thanks for being here presenters as well. Just wanted to recap a little bit from class two. A few people couldn't make class two or, or maybe weren't available, uh, didn't, didn't tune into class two. So just wanted to let you know what happened during class two. We went over sizing, tried to determine you know, how big the rain garden should be based on the amount of um, runoff that was going into the rain garden, how deep to make it. We also looked a little bit at soils and how to determine your soils, infiltration tests, and things like that. That all is um, important information in determining how to size your rain garden. Then Rick led us through construction, so site prep, digging, um, how to consider overflow and where you might want to put overflow options. Then Maddie and Emily talked a little bit about design considerations. So, you know, what type of sun do you have? Do you have partial sun? Do you have shade? Do you have full sun uh, in the area where you want to put your rain garden? What are the soils again like? And uh, we're going to talk a little bit more about that in a second. And um, the borders, what, what are your expectations for your rain garden? What, what do you, what do you kind of want it to look like? Do you want it to look um, a little more manicured? Do you like it to look more like a prairie? Are you okay with taller plants? So all those things to kind of consider is, you know, what do you, what's your ultimate goal for this rain garden? And then she also talked about social considerations. So, you know, um, your neighbors and, and uh, things like that. Emily talked about plants of the day again, good plants, bad plants, um, some superstar plants for rain gardens. And then the final, uh, the, the final assignment for, for, for the class two was to use all this information and develop a basic plan. So something that looks, looks like this down here. Again, this was my, my little plan based on the information I had, and we provided all that information in the Google Drive or the, in the Google folder. And as we were going through some of the Padlet submissions and some questions that came up, uh, we just pulled together a summary of some of the questions we had. And, and these also came up, some of these came up during class two as well. And we just wanted to go over a few things uh, with the whole class. So we did get a few questions about soils and soil, how to get soil inf or information about your soils during class two. I think we addressed most of those, uh, but I also just wanted to really reiterate that you know, you can use the, the soil survey. This is the, the website that you can go to to get a sense for what your soils might be, but don't rely heavily on that information. Uh, once, you know, once an area is developed, that can change quite a bit. So it's really, really important that you, if you don't know what your, you know, what type of soils you have, sandy, silty, you know, clay-like soils, just make sure to check those soils. I, I know it's, 
uh, not right now is not a good time to check your soils, but you know, once the snow melts and everything thaws, before you actually build your rain garden, just make sure to check those soils and make sure to conduct an infiltration test to make sure you, you know what's going on there, if you have good drainage or not and you can size your, your rain garden appropriately. So I, I know, you know, in our poll question, we asked a lot of you, do you know what your soils are like? And, and a lot of you said no, and that's totally understandable, but just something to really pay attention to as you're, as you're kind of going through this process, it's really important. Another question we got uh, was, especially in the Padlet submissions, was how do we get our water to our rain garden, especially if it's a little further away from our home, uh, if you're using roof runoff. And, you know, one easy way is to, sorry, I'm gonna admit somebody else or, Emily, would you mind admitting? Oh, okay, I think you got it. <laughs> These things just keep popping up on my screen. Um, how to get your rain, your water, roof runoff to your rain garden. So again, when it's a little further away, it's it's a little more difficult, but obviously you can extend your downspout. You can dig a trench and then um, kind of place your downspout in there and direct the water through that trench to the rain garden, maybe fill it with some rocks or, or pebbles. That's a pretty common way. And you can see that that's how it was done in, in both of these, these pictures here. I just wanted to, to bring these up to you as, as an idea or a, an example of how to do that. And then another option is you, you can bury your downspout. So maybe put some type of flexible tubing on it and bury it. Um, just make sure that it's directed down to the to the rain garden, especially if you have a really flat area, you need to make sure that that is that's directed downward towards the rain garden, so that the water is obviously flowing in the right direction. And if you go this route, you know, then you could cover it again with sod, so it, it's completely hidden, which is kind of a nice option. But if you go this route, you may want to just consult with a professional. Uh, a couple of questions of over overflow came up in the Padlet submissions. Uh, just another reminder to make sure to plan for overflow, even if you don't have a specific location where that overflow, you know, if you don't kind of carve out a little area and fill that area with rock, um, just kind of have a plan for that overflow so you know where it's going to go when it does overflow. And then just, you know, we can't solve all the world's problems with the rain garden. If you had, you know, a drainage issue um, before, hopefully we're going to fix um, some of those problems a, a little bit. Uh, but, you know, if the water's got to flow somewhere. So just make sure whatever, wherever your overflow goes, you're not creating a new problem that you didn't have there um, to begin with. So, for instance, don't start directing water to your, you know, neighbor's driveway or, you know, something like that. Uh, there were a couple questions about existing plants and how to use existing plants. Obviously, if you have exist, if you have great plants, especially native plants already available in your yard that you want to use, that's awesome. You don't have to pay for those, obviously. Uh, if they are in an area where you are planning to build your rain garden, then the I, we just wanted to mention that the best approach probably is to actually dig up those native plants create your rain garden, you want kind of that flat bottom or that basin area to be very flat and trying to kind of dig around those big roots and those those big plants is, is really difficult. So the best bet is just to dig up all those plants, put them aside, build your rain garden, and then put those plants back at that time. And then um, just wanted to cover something about terrace rain gardens. A couple people were interested in terrace rain gardens, which is great. And, you know, this kind of came up because of the green infrastructure study area um, and the reimbursement in the city of Madison. So uh, they're becoming a little more popular in the, in the city of Madison. But I just wanted to clarify a few things. If you are going to be building um, a terrace rain garden, just know that, that that terrace area is owned by the municipality. And you, depending on what municipality you live in, you need different permissions and possibly permits to actually um, do work in that or put a rain garden in that area. And it can be removed at any time because that, that's you know municipal property. So again, something to keep in mind. And then, um, also, just kind of think about how you're going to direct water to that terrace rain garden. So a lot of times, you know, that's a pretty far distance from, from your roof and you, you've got to get water to, you know, you want to feed that rain garden with water. That's the whole goal. Um, and if you don't have a curb cut, curb cuts are 
exactly that. They're they're cutouts from the street. Uh, the curb is cut out, so it directs rain, it directs um, street runoff to the rain garden. And at least I can speak in the city of Madison. If they are reconstructing a street, they will give you the option to actually get a curb cut put in, and th that that's a way that you can get a rain garden put in, or you can actually you know create a rain garden in a terrace. But you have that that curb cut that's you know, that's providing water or street runoff to that rain garden. Um, but that's only done normally when there's a street reconstruction. And you'll get notified about that in the city of Madison if that if that's an option for you. Um, otherwise, you know, you really have to get rainwater there somehow. And and that's really difficult to do over the sidewalk. Uh, you know, you could hire somebody to, you know, dig underneath the sidewalk and and place a pipe underneath the sidewalk um, or you could remove the sidewalk and then pay somebody to, to replace that sidewalk uh, but again those are all really costly options so I just want to let people know about that um, you know we, we talked about terrace rain gardens and we had pictures of terrace rain gardens and right now especially in the city of Madison in that green infrastructure study area um, those are options that are available to people that live there uh, but there's just some hoops you have to jump through for terrace rain gardens. And I just wanted to let everybody know about that. That is all I have. I'm going to stop sharing my screen now. And I believe Maddie or Emily, you are up next. Sweet. I will talk about plant selection then first. Awesome. All right, are you all able to see my screen okay? Great. Good. All right, so let's talk about plant selection. Um, so by the end of the day today, hopefully you'll have some ideas as to what kind of factors you wanna consider when you're making your planting plan. And also thinking about whether the plants that you're putting in your rain garden align with your goals for your rain garden. So for example, if you're looking to attract as many pollinators as possible, um, you would choose plants that reflect that. And if you were looking for potentially a rain garden that was on the shorter side to avoid vision hazards, um, you would choose those shorter growing plants. So um, just to remind everyone, whenever you see a plant Dane symbol at the bottom right hand side of the screen or a picture, that means that that species is available through plant Dane this spring. And I believe the deadline is March 21st to order those plants. So it's coming up pretty quick. It is. And we'll talk a little bit more about that in the wrap up too. Awesome. Thank you. Absolutely. So yeah, right off the bat here, we have one early sunflower. And you, many of you may recognize if you've ever been to Pheasant Branch Conservancy, that is the drumlin behind them there. All right, and I know you guys have seen this graphic before, but I'm gonna show it to you again, and also say again how awesome and beneficial native species are um, for your rain garden. And there is a video that I love that really displays this very well. It's from the Prairie Enthusiasts, and I'll just let him explain that here. We have the, the bre bread basket of the Midwest, this deep productive soil, all these fibrous roots in the prairie, about 60% of the biomass is below ground compared to 40% above ground. All of this root matter underneath is how carbon is fixed in, into the ground. That's how you get the black soil. And what's happening is that these plants are constantly sloughing off, developing new roots, old roots are dying, and over time, that carbon is getting left behind and keeps getting built up. So as these roots die and get replaced, they leave behind little channels when that uh, root system dies out that, that end up as being channels for water to percolate down through. And they've found the studies that they've done that um, original prairie sod can mostly eliminate surface water, water runoff, whereas Kentucky bluegrass lawn is very shallow, shallow rooted and it's dense, that a lot of the rain ends up running off. And that happens in croplands as well. You, you just don't. All right. Could you guys all hear that video? Yes. Awesome. 
So yeah, I think they do a really good job of illustrating exactly what is happening with those deep roots there and how the infiltration has just increased so much when you have those native species. Another good reason to choose a native species is that they're pretty low maintenance after they're established, especially um, if you kind of plant them a little thicker at the beginning, they tend to fill in on their own and do just well on their own. So this is a terrace rain garden that we planted. Um, and this is the, um, the first year after it was established is already filling in and doing well and blooming. Another good reason is that you don't need pesticides or fertilizers. They can make do with what is given to them in whatever soil you have, um, especially compared to how much fertilizer or um, other chemicals you may need um, to maintain your lawn. There's also hundreds of options. So that is another reason why native species are so fun is because you have um, tons of choices for height, color, bloom time, um, what kind of species it attracts for pollination, um, and you can have a, a lot of fun with it. They also are versatile. So um, when a lot of people think of a native planting, they kind of think of the photo on the right, um, kind of like a jungle-like, garden-like planting that tends to look um, maybe a little crazy to some eyes or untended or unmaintained. Um, but actually, um, you can kind of use native plants however you want to in your garden, just like you would any other plants. So in previous classes, I talked about some species and I mentioned that they were tidy clump forming. So these are the kind of species that you would use like prey drop seed or the brown fox edge that are able to kind of um, stay within one spot and kind of have that more um, well-maintained manicured look if you're looking for that. And Douglas Talamy talks about this a lot in his book, Bringing Nature Home. He kind of just discusses um, why native plants are important and also um, how you can use them in different ways to suit whatever gardening desires you may have. So they are super great for pollinators. Uh, every one of these photos, except for the pask flower on the top left, was taken on stormwater land. So these are urban spaces that since we put native species in them, we attracted the pollinators. Um, you don't have to have like a pristine prairie to attract those, those various pollinators. And we've got a couple plant dane species here. Um, third one on the top is purple prairie clover. And on the bottom left, we'll ha we have a bone set, which is also available. So now that I've pitched native plants for probably the third or fourth time during this series, um, we'll talk about the factors that you need to consider when you are making your planting plan. So the number one most important factor is how much sunlight does your rain garden get? Um, once you determine that, that will determine the rest of your choices of what plants are even available for you to choose from. So um, on the left, we have a rain garden that's pretty sunny and we've got common milkweed and spiderwort in the background there, just absolutely thriving. Um, and on the right, we have a shadier rain garden. So a lot of people worry that a shadier rain garden will be more uh, difficult to find plants for, but there are actually a lot of different native plants that prefer those shadier sites and they're gonna do better there. Um, and you do have a lot of options. And later on, I'll share some resources that you can use to um, their search tools where you can set parameters and say that my site is shady and it will give you all the options of different native shady plants. Here's a little reminder for whenever you see the traffic light um, signs. So whenever you see a green light, these are rockstar plants. Um, these are plants that we have um, seen do really well in rain gardens. They're hardy and they're well behaved. The yellow light plants are really good native plants. However, they may come with one extra challenging characteristic. So before you plant it, you may wanna just stop and consider it for a second, but they're still really great plants. And the red light plants are plant bullies, invasives in weeds that Maddie will talk more about later. So just to give a few examples of those shadier loving species, um, Tall bellflower is a really beautiful one that is available through Plant Day in this year. Um, it does really well in the shade. It gets pretty tall and it blooms decently late in the season. Um, 
This is a yellow light plant just because it's relatively short li lived. Um, but if you're liking it in your rain garden and you want more, you can just make sure to let those seeds ripen and fall into the rain garden rather than removing them. Because if you remove them, um, you won't have those new plants to replace them in the future. One thing also to note about tall bellflower is there is actually a very similar invasive species called creeping bellflower. And this species is different because it, instead of standing straight up, it curves over and all the flowers kind of dip over to one side. So if you are seeing something like that in your rain garden, but you didn't plant it, um, you definitely want to do some research and find out if it's creeping bellflower. And if so, I would definitely recommend removing it. Another really good species that does well in the shade, as well as all conditions actually, is columbine. So this is a really cool one. It's an early bloomer and it has that two-toned uh, flower, red and yellow. Um, this one is yellow as a yellow light plant because it is an aggressive reseeder. So if I knew that columbine was aggressive, but I still wanted it in my rain garden, I would probably plant fewer plants of it in the first place, and then I would monitor it year by year and see whether it's taking over more than I want it to. Another thing that you can do with the aggressive reseeders is you can actually remove those seeds before they have a chance to drop. The next factor to consider is your bloom time. So both for yourself and having the, the um, benefit of being able to view wildflowers from early spring to late fall, and also for the benefit of pollinators, um, being able to have those sources of nectar from very early in, in the season to late in the season. And early and late bloomers are especially important because when uh, pollinators and insects are coming out of their winter state or coming back and migrating back to um, this area from wherever they overwintered, they're really gonna need those early sources of nectar. They're very crucial for them. In the same way for the late blooming species, um, a lot of uh, insects are preparing to migrate or to overwinter and they're gonna need that extra energy to sustain them. So here are some examples of early bloomers. On the bottom left, we have Jacob's Ladder, which is a nice short plant that does well in most conditions. And above that, we have Golden Alexander, which is a really cool early bloomer. It's really important for monarch species coming back from Mexico. And we don't have that one through Plant Day this year, but there is a very similar species called heart-leaved Alexander that is available through Plant Day. And in the middle, we have spiderwort there. That was Maddie Dumas' plant if she were a plant. And on the right, we have shooting star, which is Rick's plant if he were a plant. As for the late bloomers, um, the majority of late blooming species are made up out of plants from the goldenrod family and the aster family. Um, these do really well together and they often have quite contrasting colors. So when I'm making a planting plan, I like to include them just because they work so well together and they are kind of like that last firework display before fall is over and it's time for winter. Another um, species that blooms very late is bottle gentian. And this one is really cool because as you can see, the, the flowering shape is, is cupped up. And so in order to pollinate it, um, the pollinator has to be strong enough to push those petals open and get inside to the resources. So it's a, it's a really um, rewarding and fun thing to see that happening in action. And this one is a yellow light plant just because it can be a little difficult to establish, but when you do establish it, it does pretty good. So the next factor to consider is soil type and moisture. And we've talked a lot about this in previous classes and uh, when the snow melts, hopefully you can take a look out in your, in your yard and decide what kind of soil you have. Um, so it's a really important thing to know what kind of uh, moisture preference your different species that you're considering have. So here's an example I like to give just because these these two species on the surface seem so similar. We've got blue vervain and hoary vervain, um, but the blue vervain prefers to be in wetter soils while the hoary vervain actually prefers to, to stay in those drier soils. And another um, step 
beyond um, considering what type of soil you have in your rain garden is also to consider the fact that your rain garden is going to have microsites. And by microsites, I mean it has um, different areas that will prefer the species will prefer different types of soil in there. So in your basin, you're going to want to put those wet loving species. Um, another word for wet soils is hyd hydric soils. On the slopes, um, you're going to want species that can tolerate those mid range of conditions. And a lot of times when you're searching for plants, they'll describe their preference as mesic. So mesic means kind of like medium range loving plants. And on the top, of your rain garden slopes or on the berm, you can put those dry loving species. And one thing to consider, especially for rain gardens, is that um, in large rain events, the basin of your rain garden is going to be holding water temporarily. And you're going to want to choose plants that are going to be able to sustain being inundated for at least a short time. And one of my favorite resources for finding out information like this is the Plants for Stormwater Design which was put forth by the Minnesota Pollution Control Agency. Um, and basically they have um, every native species that I've ever wanted to look up. They have a page featuring that species with a short description as well as a graphic um, for each species. So here on this slide, here is the graphic for uh, swamp milkweed. And we can see that it can tolerate a depth of 18 inches of rain for up to three days. So here's one that I would throw up on the berm or the upper slopes, dotted mint or monarda, um, closely related to bee balm. This would be pretty good for the berms and it doesn't get too tall, about two feet in height. It also has a really cool structure. It always kind of reminded me of um, maybe a pagoda building or something like that. One that I would throw in the lower slopes or even in the basin would be nodding onion. This is our native onion and it has a really attractive uh, form to it. It kind of just droops over to the side. Um, it's kind of a characteristic plant in my mind. Doesn't get too tall, about 18 inches and it blooms July through August. Another one that I would throw in the basin or the lower slopes would be mountain mint. Um, this one forms colonies, but uh, they're not too aggressive. So if you're looking for one to fill space, but not to take over, this would be a good one. Another factor to consider is height. So this will go a lot along with what your goals for your rain garden is. So if you're looking for a giant towering jungle, these would be some good species to throw in there. Um, that's my favorite picture of Maddie on the far left. Um, that's actually down in a greenway ditch um, adjacent to the southwest bike path. Um, and that plant is called Angelica. It can get super tall, around seven feet tall, and it really likes those, those wet environments. Next, there's Big Blue Stem, which is kind of a prairie classic and enjoys those mesic to dry soils. And Tall Meadow Rue enjoys the slightly wetter soils. And rosin weed's another one that gets really tall. And that one is a member of the Silphium family. And all of the members of the Silphium family are famously tall, if you're looking for that height. Here was my plant, if I were a plant, Great St. John's wort, also gets pretty tall. And then here are some shorter species. So, Native plants, you're going to have a lot of options for height. They don't, they aren't all just towering giants. So in fact, there's a lot of native ground covers to choose from too. So a few classes ago, we talked about wild strawberry and how that one can be a ground cover, but there's more than that. There's wild geranium, which is a really good one for those shady sites. And Canada anemone is really good at um, being hardy and surviving kind of whatever is thrown at it. So here's Canada anemone here, and this is actually in one of the medians we maintain. So that gets snow and salt and, and uh, runoff pushed up on it, and it does just fine. And then here is the one of the Coreopsis species that is available through Plant Dane this year, San Coreopsis. So this is a really good one. 
it doesn't get too tall, two feet tall, and then it's an early bloomer as well. So it can start blooming as early as May. Another factor to consider is growth pattern. So um, if you're looking for a planting that you'd like to see some height, but you'd still like to see those spikes of height, you can do that. Or if you're looking for a species to fill in that space, you can find species to do that too. So all of these species here are have kind of been labeled as, as aggressive. Um, enthusiastic spreaders is another way to say that. Um, and all of these would be yellow light um, species just because of that fact. Um, and it doesn't mean these are bad species, it's just because they evolved in a much larger space where when they spread their legs, they didn't really impact the diversity of the plants around them. But when you translate that to a little tiny rain garden, um, they can um, kind of take away from other plants sometimes. So I would just be careful when planting aggressive species and maybe plant fewer of them um, off the bat, just so you can be prepared for how they may behave. Um, on the flip side, they can also be super useful. So if you have bare spots in your rain garden that you wanna fill, it can easily be done by planting one of these aggressive species if you don't mind it filling in all those extra gaps. So here is an example of a more aggressive one, obedient plant, which is very ironic because people say it is very disobedient in small plantings. Um, so it gets about four feet tall. It's pretty aggressive in, in small environments. Um, and it's the actual reason why it's called an obedient plant is that when it is healthy, you can actually take those little, little flowers on it and you can push them side to side and they'll actually stay exactly where you push them. And it's very entertaining. Another one that is a little more aggressive is foxglove beard tongue, also a really cool plant name. Um, this is in the Penstemon family. And this one's a really aggressive reseeder. So um, if I noticed that I had foxglove beard tongue in my rain garden and it was getting a little too comfortable and starting to be a bully to other plants, what I would do is I would remove those seeds before it had the chance to drop them. So here is what I was talking about when I said that you may want some spikes of height in your rain garden. So these are really nice ones to pair with those shorter species if you want them to stand out and even those native ground covers. So on the left, there's cardinal flower and uh, that's what Crystal would be if she were a native plant. And this is a really awesome plant because that red color is really gonna attract those hummingbirds. Um, one thing about cardinal flower is it's relatively short lived. So you're gonna wanna make sure that um, the seeds are able to ripen and drop and reseed and carry on to the next generation in your rain garden if you wanna keep seeing it. Um, plants in the liatris species are also really good narrow spikes of height. Um, those are really popular with the monarch species and um, that species in the photo, which is dense blazing star, I believe, or Latris pycnostatia is available at plant day in this year. And then on the right, we have shooting star. Um, so this is a really cool one. Um, just note that it may take several years to flower, but when it does, it's really satisfying. Another factor to consider is pollinators. So are you attracting a lot of pollinators with the plants that you put in? And if you're choosing mostly native plants, you're already doing pretty well and you're gonna attract a lot of them. But here are some that we have noticed attract a lot of pollinators. So right in the middle, we've got wild bergamot. That's that other Monarda species. Um, and this will attract so many bees that you'll be able to hear just like a constant humming when you walk by. It's it's a cool thing to see. Um, on the right, we have Meadow Blazing Star, which is uh, one of those Liatra species. And this one is really special because for whatever reason, even compared to the other Liatra species, monarchs are so attracted to it. So even if you have a couple stems of this in your rain garden, monarchs will come. They will be there and there will be multiple monarchs on that plant. Hyssop is also a really good one. And then the the milkweeds also, of course, are really important. Um, many of you may know that uh, milkweeds are really important for monarchs. They, are, they, they need the milkweeds, it's their host plant to survive. Um, 
So when common milkweed, where common milkweed is concerned, um, monarchs are gonna need 30 stems to support one adult monarch butterfly. But besides common milkweed, there are actually like a lot of different types of milkweed that you can choose from. So earlier, um, when I talked about soil moisture, we talked about swamp milkweed. That's one that really likes those wet environments. And up above common milkweed there, we have butterfly milkweed, which is a really amazing orange color and it usually doesn't get too tall, maybe two feet tops. Um, there are also milkweed species that do well in the shade. And here's one last one, world milkweed. This one's pretty short and it grows and it grows uh, clonally, so it'll form patches. So just be aware of that. But it definitely looks a lot different from the common milkweed. So you have a lot of different forms to choose from if you want to include something like this in your planting plan. Another factor to consider is diversity. So it's really easy to get excited and um, kind of carried away with the wildflowers and the forbs. But also really important in most plantings is including some grasses and some sedges. So on the far left, there there is rattlesnake grass, which is a wet loving grass. And this is a really cool one, um, just because of the way the seeds are formed, it looks like a little rattlesnake tail. Indian grass in the middle is a, is a tall prairie grass, um, pretty similar to big blue stem that and this is available through Plant Day in this year. And on the right, there's a shade loving grass, bottle brush grass. So there's a native grass for every occasion. We also have the native short grasses and these are really good ones if you're looking for that tidy manicured look to your rain garden because they all tend to form these little clumps. Um, so we talked about prairie drop seed in the first class um, but then there's also side oats grandma and little blue stem. And including grass species in your rain garden and leaving them up throughout the winter is also going to be a really good resource for um, overwintering insects. Next on diversity, um, I also like to include uh, sedge species in my planting, at least one. And we talked about the brown fox sedge, which is available available through Plant Dane, um, but there's tons of other sedge species. Um, sedge species are the family name Carex, C-A-R-E-X, if you wanna explore some of those. And a lot of these species do really well in standing water. They're quite hardy and they're ideal choices for your rain garden basin. You may also wanna consider um, planting a plant that maybe you don't expect to do well in your rain garden. Um, so there's a lot of plants that maybe you may think that you'll only see it in kind of the most restored habitat or on undisturbed soil, but in a lot of cases um, they can actually do just well in urban environments. So um, in my own experience with wood betony, I always expected only to see that in kind of like the undisturbed soils and, and really nice habitat. And I keep coming across it on stormwater land, which surprises me every time and it shouldn't surprise me anymore. Um, so if you, if you are considering one of these species but are nervous about um, using it just because you think you won't succeed, it may be worth it just to try one and, and test it out and see. And if you wanna look into more about planting conservative species like this, on uh, disturbed land, you can check out this presentation by Scott Weber. One more thing that I like to include in each of my planting plans is at least one type of legume. So legumes like beans, they fix nitrogen to soil and they can provide um, those nutrients to the plants around them. So one legume that is available through Plant Dane is lead plant. Um, and purple prairie clover is another legume that is available through there. Here's one more that's available, white false indigo. And this one is a really interesting one because its structure um, is kind of wild and it stands out and you're planting quite well. All right, so that was kind of a lot to talk about. Um, so, 
when you get around to kind of considering what kind of plants you you want and you think about all those different specific factors make sure you zoom out at the end and you ask yourself do you like the color combinations are you attracting the species that you want to attract with those plants um, do they fit in with your rain garden goals and if they don't maybe you want to just alter things a little bit so we have a lot of resources for you um, just to explore different kinds of plants and different planting plans. So we provided some of our city planting plans at Madison um, just to get inspiration. And a lot of these plans also indicate um, what kind of soil preference each plant likes. So whether they prefer the wet basin, the medium or mesic slopes, or the drier berm. Um, some of these also could be used um, if you have a certain goal in mind. So the planting plan we have here on the right is our short and sweet plan. And that is a special plan with no, no plants um, taller than three feet. And it's for people who are looking for that shorter um, plan that isn't gonna cause vision hazards, or maybe you want it to be shorter because of social considerations. Another good source of information is the 2021 plant name species quick list. So um, especially if you're gonna be ordering plants from here, you can kinda um, choose according to the different factors. And each plant has information as to what color it is, what height it is, what sun exposure it, it prefers, its bloom time and its soil moisture. And remember the mesic soil is the medium soils. We also are going to give you a whole bunch of links of our favorite sources to explore and look for plants. Um, so a lot of these tools are going to be um, search functions where you can actually set your parameters. So you can set your parameters to say, I have, a, I'm looking for shady plants that don't get taller than four feet um, that bloom in August. Um, you can set all those parameters and you can kind of cover all the bases of the plants that you want to look for um, by using those search functions. And in addition to the search functions and the plant finders, there's also a lot of good information resources. So the Online Virtual Flora of Wisconsin, Illinois Wildflowers, Minnesota Wildflowers, all are really good sources for if you're more curious about your plant in the and you're not finding as much information as you want, you'll be able to get really detailed descriptions of these plants on those sites. And also linked in there is the Plants for Stormwater Design. If you're looking to see um, what the uh, water level tolerance of your plant is. And with that, that is all I have. Happy planting. Thank you, Emily. I saw some questions in the chat and I think uh, Maddie and Teresa have answered most of those. I don't think we need to go through those right now. I just saw the cat typing one. I, that was funny. <laughs> <laughs> uh, please keep, you know, keep putting your questions in the chat and we'll, we'll do our best to, to answer them as people are presenting. All right, next up, Maddie, are you, are you ready to go now or would you like to take a yeah. break first? Well, um, I'll do a really quick presentation about just kind of planting and then we can take a break if that's all right with everyone. Sounds good. All right. Okay. All right. Can everyone see that? Great. Um, so thanks, Emily. Um, now that you all know the plants that you are certainly going to be putting in your garden, I'll just throw in a couple tips about um, how to get started planting. Um, I know that throughout the course of this workshop, we've talked a lot about soil, um, but certainly before you dive into planting, if you're interested in doing any soil amendments, if you discovered something about your soil um, that it's unsavory. Um, you'll want to do that before you plant. Um, a suggested amendment would be a mix of soil that's 50% sand, 25% compost, and 25% topsoil. Um, on the other hand, if you choose not to do soil amendments, 
Um, Emily showed you that great video about how native plants and really most all plants are going to be um, creating lots of pockets of air into your soil um, that will help with infiltration. So you should be able to eventually get there with just about any soil type. But if you are concerned, um, certainly think about amending it now. Um, whether you're amending or not, uh, once you have your um, basin dug out, you're going to want to uh, till, rake, turn, fluff the soil up a little bit and try to avoid compacting it before you stick your plants in. I'm sure you all are thinking of what tools you might use for this job. A tarp, a weed bag, a wheelbarrow to kind of move soil around. A few tools you may not have thought about using are a rototiller, if you have one or can borrow one to break up that soil, especially if it was underneath lawn and it's really compacted, that can be useful. Uh, you can also use a sod cutter. Um, there's a manual one up in the upper left there, which is um, it's hard work to use, but certainly that's an option to kind of strip that grass off. Um, or you can rent a mechanical uh, motorized, sorry, soil sod cutter from a big box store or a hardware store. That can be a useful option. All right, so there was a question about this in the chat box. Uh, when you're spacing your plants, we typically, when we're doing our city rain gardens, we'll plan for one plant per square foot. And then it almost always ends up being more plants, uh, you know, the basin just ended up being a little bit smaller during construction. And that's actually fine. Uh, we found, you know, six inches is still, it's going to help your garden fill in really quickly. Although it's not necessary, if you want to go by about one square foot, that will work out pretty well. Um, you can find really specific information about each individual plant species on um, a lot of the resources that Emily showed you, but certainly Prairie Moon Nursery website is going to have that information. If you're worried about, hey, I'm using a more aggressive species that grows taller faster, should I space them a little further apart? Uh, that will have that information for you. Um, just like an aesthetic note, uh, you'll want to cluster your plants in groups of three to seven uh, per species. If you dot them around the landscape, it, it's going to have a less visually appealing effect when they flower. Um, and I'll show you some examples of what that looks like in a minute. And then um, limit your species. You know, there might be 50 species that you love, but um, pretty much no rain garden is going to be big enough to really give all of those plants a fair shot. So a suggested formula that I have is, you know, one to three blooming species for each part of the growing seasons, you know, early, mid, and late. And you can kind of beef those up a little more in the mid and the late. It, it can be harder to find the early blooming plants. Um, although they are super great and important for our pollinators. Um, Emily showed you some great grass and sedge species. Always include at least one of those. More is great. Um, they provide support, you know, structural support as well as um, symbiotic support with other flowers that you're looking at planting. And then just a shout out to our monarchs. Um, if you can, please include at least one milkweed species. They really need our help. So there's a few different options there. Um, Emily went over this a little bit, but be aware of your growth pattern. You know, some plants like on the far right, the New England Aster branch really widely and they get really tall. You're not going to want to use as many plants um, if, for your small rain garden. Um, some like this uh, Latris Ligula stylus remain really upright. Um, use more of them, kind of intersperse them amongst your plantings. Um, and you can see here an example of why you want grasses and other structural support for your wildflowers. It's kind of tilting over in this. Uh, parking lot planting. Uh, and then before you put your plant in the ground, um, if you've not done a lot of planting, you want to break up any root bound uh, plants. So if the plant comes out of the pot and it looks like the shape of the pot, break those up gently before you stick it in the ground to, to help the plant uh, penetrate roots into the soil. So here is an example of a planting uh, on one of our engineering facilities, a roof garden. And you can see we have uh, clumped our plants and I think it makes for a nice visual appeal. We've got purple prairie clover here in a nice clump next to some um, orange butterfly weed and in the back we've got gray-headed coneflower, a nice tall yellow plant, some daylilies we haven't dug out yet, but it really makes for uh, a nicer visual appeal when you clump your plants. And just a couple more examples of clumping here. 
Crystal touched on this, but um, definitely reuse plants. If you're installing your rain garden in an area where you already have plants, dig them completely out and put back the ones that you think are appropriate. Um, you can also reuse plants from the rest of your yard, or you can borrow plants from neighbors and friends. Um, I would lean more towards um, taking plants from your neighbors just because, you know, when it comes to soil pathogens and certainly jumping worm, you're less likely to run into problems. So if you want more information about jumping worm, um, actually I can put some of this in our Google Drive, but the Arboretum has a lot of resources, so. Uh, other ways you can get plants into your garden, as Emily said, um, you can actually just leave some of the plants that you planted to go to seed and drop their seed and that will help your garden fill in um, over the years. If you don't like the plants or you're seeing too many of one, then yeah, cut them out and remove them. Um, you can actually start rain gardens completely from seed. It definitely takes a little, little more time, a lot more weeding. And if you do decide to go that route, I would almost completely block off your water source initially because you don't want to wash your seeds away. Um, interseeding can be either letting your plants that are already there drop seed or, you know, just throwing some new seed species in. Um, if you do decide to add seed to your garden, um, try to aim for a late fall or winter planting, um, sometimes early spring as well. Um, most of our native species need the cold, moist weather of winter to be able to um, stimulate germination. Um, so if you plant um, too late in spring or middle of the summer, they're just not going to do anything. And finally, you can, of course, start your own plants. Um, these are just some pots that I threw some prairie smoke seeds on top of the soil and put them on my back step over winter, and I was able to germinate some really nice seedlings that way. All right, and one final option, which I wouldn't expect many people to want to go this route, but it's just kind of something fun to bring up, and you can think about it maybe for future projects. Native vegetative mat, it's essentially a native plant uh, turf. Um, you'll have to go to a special nursery to find this. Agricole nursery in our area is one that grows um, NVM. Um, and it's really helpful for difficult to establish areas. So City of Madison, we had a section along Willow Creek on the University of Wisconsin uh, campus where we had almost a one-to-one -one slope. When it was reconstructed, you can see the initial planting completely failed. Um, but we went in with native vegetative mat and it really filled in nicely. So if you've got a really steep slope, if you're looking at vegetating a shoreline, um, or if you have a rain garden that you're, that you're trying to do that's just really shady or wet, um, you could give it a try with uh, native vegetative mat. So that was what I had about planting. Maybe we'll take a break, Crystal? Sounds good. All right, everybody. Thanks, Maddie. We'll hear more from Maddie later. And with that, I'm going to leave you with a poll question. Oh, well, I was going to leave you with a poll question. Hmm. Not sure why my poll is not working. I apologize. I had it up earlier. <laughs> Let's see if there's something I did wrong here. Well, that's okay. It was just a simple question. We were, <laughs> you'd think technology would come through for me in the last class here, here but. It's up now, Crystal. Yeah, I oh. got it. Oh, you got it, huh? <laughs> no, I, can't, it. I can't see it on my end. <laughs> I, I launched it. Oh, you were trying. It was, so everybody saw it, and now it's gone. Okay, well, not sure what's going on there, but it was just a simple question. We just were wondering if you were thinking of having, or building your rain garden this year, if you kind of went through this class and and um, you're ready to, to install a rain garden, was that gonna happen this year? So if, if you're interested, you can uh, you can put your answers in the chat and, and we can see what everybody's doing, but. Who knows? Maybe it'll come up later. Pop up in the middle of somebody else's presentation, maybe. Well, we'll give you each a, a five-minute break here. It's 6.57 on my end, so we will start up again at 7.03. I'm going to resume recording now. 
Maddie, were you going to start us start us off or was Rick going to start us off? I'll start us off and then actually uh, Rick and I kind of have a shared presentation, so I'll pass the baton off. Okay. Sounds like a plan. Yeah. All right. Welcome back, everyone. Okay. Are we good? Everyone can see that? Yep. Great. Um, so now that you know all of the plants you want and you've stuck them in the ground, you might wonder a little bit about maintenance. Uh, the good thing is, uh, you know, if you're planting with native plants, and even if you're not, most rain gardens are fairly low key, um, maintenance wise. So in your first few weeks, of course, you're going to want to water all your new plants. Think about at least an inch of water per week. So if we're not getting that much in rain per week, then uh, you'll want to put a sprinkler or a hose on them for a while. Um, a good tip is to water at night. You know, it saves water because you're not evaporating a lot of that water away. Um, twice a week is a good rule of thumb uh, rather than one big deluge of water. You know, you don't want your plants to drown. Um, and along those lines, it may actually be necessary if we're getting a lot of rain to block off your water source. So kind of as a rule of thumb, when we install terrace rain gardens now, we just put sandbags across the inlet initially to let those plants establish. Um, and you can see on the right, we've got an example of a rain garden where we were just getting a lot of water down off that slope and it was creating some gulling in our rain garden. So we put a line of sandbags and that uh, kind of helped ease the problem. And it's just a temporary solution until your rain garden uh, is established and then you really want all that water in there. Um, again, in the first few weeks, uh, your, your rain garden is gonna look pretty different from a mature rain garden. So you're coming in with these little seedlings um, and if, you know, if you're not careful, they can look really different from the mature full grown plant. So um, if you're not real familiar with your seedlings, maybe put some plant markers next to some of them. Is an immature um, uh, cup plant on the left and mature cup plant on the right, pretty different looking. Um, so think about that if you're worried about losing track of them. All right, and then the biggest thing you can do to help your rain garden get established is just weed, weed, weed. Do a lot of weeding in the first few weeks in the first season that you have your garden. Um, we have some resources, a nice weed watch list that Emily put together on our um, Google Drive. Uh, but a few really common ones that you might see are lamb's quarters, wild spinach, you know, pull that one out and just eat it. It's actually really yummy, um, but it doesn't need to be in your rain garden. Um, annual ragweed and giant ragweed, if, you know, you have allergies, you want those out of there anyway. Um, really anything woody, unless you specifically planted a shrub or something, and then you'll know what it is. Um, and then almost all of the grasses, you're going to want to get out of there right away. Um, down at the bottom right, I included deadly nightshade vine because um, I, I found that a lot of people don't know what it is actually, but it's got this very distinctive dark purple flower, um, very distinctive red berries, you know, you don't want to eat it, um, but it's a vine, it can really take over, so rip that one out when you see it too. Um, just a little more about foxtail grass and reed canary grass. Uh, foxtail grass is I think far and away the weed that we get the most in our rain gardens um, and it's got that really fluffy seed head and when they ripen just tiny seeds rain everywhere so be sure you get in there and dig that one out as soon as you see it. Um, reed canary grass on the right is um, one of those difficult invasive plants that we have to deal with. In a small rain garden you know odds are you're going to be able to control it but it spreads through a pretty extensive root system. So if you let it get established, then you're gonna have trouble eradicating it later on. So um, one way to identify it is it's got a really distinctive um, bamboo-like appearance. The way that the leaf attaches to the stem, it's kind of a jaunty 45 degree angle. So if you stand back from a distance, it kind of looks like you're looking at a miniature bamboo forest. Um, there are lots of other ways to identify reed canary grass and those, those resources can be found on our Google Drive or online as well, but um, keep an eye out for those grasses. Um, during the course of putting together this workshop, we got an email from 
um, some DNR AIS specialists, aquatic invasive species specialists, and they mentioned just a couple uh, invasive aquatic plants to look out for. You may have heard about purple loosestrife. It's a beautiful um, uh, Eurasian invasive plant that is really taking over a lot of our wetlands. Uh, the, uh, the purple loosestrife beetle that's been introduced, actually there's a few different insects um, that can really help to keep it in check, but it is around and if you see a plant growing in your garden that is spiky and purple and beautiful and you don't know what it is, you might just want to check it out and make sure it's not purple loosestrife. Um, another invasive is yellow flag iris, which is still planted sometimes, but it really is a restricted species and we don't want to be planting it. It can spread all over and we have lots of other um, native iris species that can be planted instead that are just as beautiful. All right, so common rain garden pitfalls to look out for. Um, if you're noticing that you're getting a lot of ponding in your rain garden, um, it may be that your rain garden just isn't big enough for your drainage area. So it, it could have been a sizing problem. Um, maybe the soil was too clay. Um, you know, worst case scenario, you may need to expand your rain garden or limit the size of your drainage area. So if you can redirect a downspout for a couple of rain events and see if that helps, um, maybe you've solved your problem. Maybe once your plants get established, you can actually start directing more water to it again. Um, but definitely something to troubleshoot if you're getting that ponding issue. Um, if your plants aren't thriving, um, you know, again, this could be a, a location issue. So uh, pay close attention to the amount of shade that you have, maybe the amount of shade that you will be getting if somebody's neighboring shrub is going to get bigger and start shading out your plants sooner than you think. Um, too many of one species thriving, so that's just a, you know, taking care when you're making your planting plan not to have too many of those aggressive species, um, and then just thinning them out if you are getting too many of those. Um, we've got a, a lovely rain garden on the right here that is almost entirely Canada thistle. If you're getting weeds thriving, um, you really just have to do regular maintenance in the first few years. That's going to be your best bet to kind of keep those under control. Uh, and certainly with something aggressive like Canada thistle that spreads through the root system, um, pull them out as soon as you see them so you don't get a, a thriving clone. Um, finally, the worst case scenario, I suppose, um, would be structural damage to your house if you're causing flooding in your house or flooding in your neighbor's yard. Um, so remember to be sure to site your rain garden at least 10 feet away from the foundation of your house, downslope, you know, away from areas where it's going to overflow into your neighbor's yard or into somebody else's yard. So be sure you're siting appropriately. All right, so ongoing maintenance. Um, a lot of us are accustomed to removing vegetation at the end of the season from your yard. Um, and that would be a typical approach to maintaining your rain garden as well. Um, for the sake of our pollinators, we would encourage you to think about um, leaving some of those dead stalks. A really nice approach that I've seen recommended um, is to lock the tops off of some of your plants and you can do it at various heights and then just leave the, the stuff that you lopped off um, on the ground over winter. Um, it creates a nice visual appeal to have some dead seed heads over the winter. It's something for birds to perch on, it's something to look at and for snow to accumulate on. So there are benefits aesthetically as well. Um, but at least 30% of our bees are um, hollow uh, wood or stem nesters. So if you're leaving some of that material, you're really providing good habitat for those insects. Um, other approaches to removing accumulated dead vegetation um, you can mow over your rain garden, just kind of mulch all that material up, um, or you can burn as well. Um, again, I say do not remove material in fall. I understand some of these are kind of showcase gardens. You might want a more manicured look. So really think about uh, what you're willing to live with. You know, if you're willing to live with a little bit of a messier look um, and leave it until spring, that's great. If you want a more tidy look, that's totally fine. Maybe you can do half and half with your garden. Uh, one way that we maintain our rain gardens is we do prescribe burns, and that's something you can do in your garden as well. Um, you know, check with your specific municipality, but uh, City of Madison, certainly there is uh, a burn permit you can take out to burn your, your rain garden if you choose. Um, the benefits of burning are that uh, a lot of our native plants have adapted to burns, so 
they tend to thrive in the soil that's been opened up with the nutrients that are released from a burn. Um, it can set back some of our invasive plants, although it's not a surefire uh, weed control. Um, and yeah, it really just helps clean up some of that material. Uh, if you choose to burn, you certainly don't need to do it every year. A cycle of once every three or four years is great to kind of get some of that nutrient back to the soil. Um, other ongoing maintenance, you know, water, uh, monitor your water supply source. So if you're, if you have certainly a, a buried downspout, you'll want to check that annually at least, um, see if it's getting clogged up. Um, but really all of your downspouts, make sure you don't have stuff uh, backing up so you're not getting the full benefit of your rain garden. Um, you might see erosion around the basin and that might mean that you just need to stick a few more plants in there, um, stabilize that slope. Um, we recommend mulching after you put your plants in the ground the first time. It, you know, will help with the weeding issue um, and it really just looks nice initially. Um, once your plants are established, you don't need to continue to mulch, um, but if you do decide to do that, um, you might focus more on the areas around the berm just because that's your showier area. All right, and then now you have a mature rain garden. Um, one thing to watch out for is just monitoring for any changes in the performance of your rain garden. You know, if it used to drain in a couple hours and now it's taking 24 or more, um, you might wanna do a little investigation. Uh, one thing that can happen, especially if you're leaving your vegetation uh, for pollinators, um, is that you get kind of a, a layered stratified mash of leaves and dead vegetation that is um, dense and isn't allowing water to penetrate. So if that's the case, you know, you can kind of loosen it up, maybe remove some of that material, um, rake it out. Um, another thing, if you're getting just like a, a really slow draining rain garden, maybe uh, till in some compost. Um, and, you know, last case scenario, if you're really not seeing it, um, uh, draining, you might want to reduce some of that water supply because it could be that over the course of the years since you built your rain garden, um, you're just getting more water going into your rain garden. There's more drainage area. Um, and if that's the case, then your rain garden maybe wasn't the size to handle that. This isn't a huge problem for most rain gardens, but um, you know, it's something to look out for, excessive sedimentation. We see this in our terrace rain gardens because the city of Madison puts a lot of sand on the roads in the winter. Um, and that all washes into our terrace rain gardens. Um, so, you know, check around, see if you have just a lot of extra sand. Um, if that is the case, um, you may wanna consider dredging out your rain garden. So you can do that by just carefully digging around your plants, removing a, a layer of soil, um, or you can actually dig out all of your plants, um, dig out a layer of soil, maybe even add a layer of compost and kind of uh, break that in and then add your plants back in. Um, I think there were a few comments on Padlet about, you know, rain gardens that you already had, they weren't flourishing. Um, this could be approach, an approach you could think about, you know, revamping that rain garden by removing the plants entirely and amending the soil a little bit. Um, and of course, if you do decide to do that, you can break up some of those plants and share them with friends. All right, and now I'm gonna pass the baton over to Rick, who's gonna talk about a specific rain garden project. Awesome, thanks, Maddie. So yeah, we'll go back to, yeah. Actually, do you want, if you wanna just uh, run it uh, from there, Maddie, um, then I don't have to reopen it up. Absolutely. I'm gonna mute myself so I don't. So the, the, just the maintenance uh, slides that I'll be going over are just uh, kind of revisiting the community rain garden in Fitchburg that uh, I showed uh, last at the last session. Um, the upper two in the um, upper left and in the middle left or middle, upper middle <laughs> um, are basically the winter conditions for that first uh, winter right after the planting. So you can see obviously the snow melt has just started. There's still a lot of snow um, one of the things that uh, we did work with our, our, uh, um, our park staff that uh, do the snow plowing is we encourage them not to plow the snow into the rain garden. Um, generally that, you know, the concern is that that, that can compact the soils and, and uh, lead to, to, you know, greater problems um, with, uh, you know, less infiltration occurring. Um, upper right is uh, um, some of my coworkers helping me uh, with uh, weeding, uh, we, when we when we planted, 
we had probably about a 12 to 18 inch spacing uh, with the plants that we had. And then we also interseeded um, on top of that. So um, both a combination of both native seed and annual ryegrass. Um, so the annual ryegrass obviously come, comes up, you know, it came up that, um, some of it came up the first year and then some might, uh, um, you know, come up that following year. We did a combination of both, both pulling, pulling um, the ryegrass as well as the, as, as well as just cutting it because it's an annual, as long as you cut it so that it doesn't recede, um, that should that should take care of it. Um, bottom left and, and middle bottom are, are just kind of the sparse condition, you know, that first uh, April time period. Um, so you can kind of see see what it first started looking like that that, that first year afterwards. And, and, the, and then uh, in some of the other pictures, we can go on to year, year three with a rain. Um, so generally, you know, you want you want to um, certainly take care of, you know, removing any trash and recyclables. Um, the upper left is is uh, the Girl Scout troop that actually helped plant the rain garden initially came back uh, year after year and and uh, incorporated that into their curriculum. Um, and so we we had different things that they could help with with doing, and certainly you know we want to try to minimize or reduce any trash and and uh, recycl re recyclables in the rain garden. Um, it's a good idea to just, uh, you know, every so often, if there's species you're not sure about, just have, have, have a friend that know, is pretty knowledgeable. So is Adam um, um, taking, a, taking a look and, and providing some, some guidance on what's actually coming, coming in. Um, and uh, so the, the bottom left is a little bit hard to tell, but there's a, 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 a thistle that's, that's coming in there. And so we did take that out and, and uh, again, a lot of times you'll get some early successional um, weed species that uh, are good to, to make sure you, you address and, and uh, remove as soon as you, pop, as soon as you can, um, just to let the natives thrive better. Um, and then there might be some species that you just don't want, want where they were. This particular cup plant on the far, on the far right, um, it, it, cup plant can get quite tall. Um, you know, I've seen species of, uh, or some of these that get 12 to 14 feet tall and, and uh, in, in some, you know, smaller rain gardens, it's kind of be over, overbearing. So, you know, if there's a weed species, if there's a native, even if it's native, you don't like it, just, just cut it out. Rain. Next. Um, so the upper, upper left, basically just, uh, um, I guess I, I took a shot um, that uh, showed the berm downstream. And so we did have quite a lot of dandelions in the berm and, and some areas that um, where it was mulched that uh, mulched around the trees that were transplanted you know, we're starting to get get weedy but uh, um, just working with the, the staff um, that we had just to identify what where where to mow and and where not to mow we did put a prairie drop seed border on which was really tough for for our crews to differentiate between grass and prairie drop seed and so that's something to be aware of if you're I mean, if you're doing if you if you're doing the maintenance yourself and you can distinguish that, that that's great. If if there's not you know if you're not, uh, it's good to make sure that whoever's doing the the mat, the mowing around the perimeter kind of knows which species to look at. Um, you can see obviously um, things are really starting to, to fill in pretty nicely by year four. Next rain. Um, year five, we actually burned it. Um, so this is uh, Steve Banovitz in the middle, um, upper middle, um, actually kind of going over with our with our park staff. We probably spent about 15 minutes or so describing um, kind of the process for burning, you know, the safety procedures, um, equipment. Um, so in the, the left, upper and, and bottom, you can see some of the equipment that uh, Steve brought along. Um, you don't need a lot of equipment and you know this is obviously you know I mean you can kind of just use stuff that you have to um, but it is good to make sure you have a water source for for putting you know to, to just pre-wet um, certain areas that you want to preserve and and not uh, not burn um, and then you know certainly have have it on hand if, it, if stuff does get out of control you want to look very carefully at the humidity the the moisture conditions um, you know, and, and you know, you don't want it to be too dry because it might uh, just take off on you. Um, but uh, um, you know, again, for all the time that you know, you spend a lot more time in the prep um, than actually burning. This burn, you know, of a, I mean, pretty decent. I mean, it'd be larger than most standard residential rain gardens, 
but uh, Steve had it burned in four minutes. Rain. Yes. And Maddie can talk through this slide. Maddie and Rick, I just want to let you know we, we have about seven minutes left um, for the workshop. So I know we have to get through the wrap up too. So just, just an yep. FYI. So I think the last slide that Maddie had was was uh, just a, a resources, and we'll have that in the the um, the rain garden resources. There you go. Yep, exactly. So not much to talk about here, but just more resources. Again, all of this will be included in our our Google Drive. And just one quick uh, thing on the bottom: the native vegetation and invasive species identification and management. One of the things that I've one of the ways that I learned a lot about the nat native plants. Um, with just uh, making visits to the arboretum. Um, you can, you know, a lot of times on, on um, weekends, you can uh, um, just uh, visit and, and uh, do tours of, of various places like the Green Prairie or Curtis Prairie and, and actually have volunteers kind of lead you through uh, identifying what species are there. Um, it's a great way to, um, to just learn about species and, and talk with a lot, of, a lot of other people that are interested in the same thing. Thanks, Rick. That's a great idea. Okay, thank you, Maddie and Rick. All right, I'm gonna pull up the, I'm gonna share my screen in a second. All right, can everybody see, oops, jumping ahead, the plant dance screen. I hope. Yep. Okay. Sorry, I can only see three of you, or actually myself, Maddie, and uh, and Rick. So I'm relying on you guys nodding or thumbs up or whatever. Okay. Um, so just wrapping up uh, this three day workshop that that you've joined us for. I wanted to just share a little more information about Plant Dane. I covered it very briefly in um, in class one, but just some more information. So as you probably know already, Plant Dane is our I guess our program to, to encourage people to, to plant native plants and install rain gardens. And the reason that uh, Dane County and the Ma specifically the Madison Area Municipal Stormwater Partnership is um, promoting native plants uh, is because of, of the infiltration um, properties that native plants have. So when they're when they're in the ground and you learned all about the deep root systems, um, they really act as help that soil act as a sponge and allow that water to drain, um, soak into the ground. So again, reducing reducing runoff. But there's so many other benefits to native plants, right? So uh, this is this is why we have this program, and uh, we run this every year about the same time. The order system opens up. Uh, so there's different components to the program. One is just you know encouraging people to, to order native plants at a reduced, we offer it at a reduced cost because we have such a, a huge uh, amount that we are, that everybody orders that we're able to get a discount through Agricol. So we work with Agricol on this. Uh, you can order native plants online. The website's right down here. Uh, Emily already talked to you at length about the different native species that are offered through Plant Dane. And so this year and most years, we have about 40 to 50 species available, and then also rain garden kits and, and pollinator kits that you can just get as well. So those are, I believe, um, packs of 32 plants that were selected as a kit, and you can just buy those uh, just to make things simple if you'd like. And we are offering two rain garden kits. So one is for full sun and one is partial sun. The cost is $2.25 a plant, and you have to order them in packs of four. The order deadline is this coming Sunday, March 21st, and the plant pickup is May 22nd. And we have kind of our whole system because of last year where it's very COVID safe. It's pretty much a drive-through at the Land and Water Resources Department office. You really don't even have to get out of your car. You just kind of show your order number, and um, we place the plants in front of your car. We leave. You just put your plants and load your plants in your car so there's really no contact with anybody. Uh, another part of the program, uh, we have something called a free native plants for school and community 
community groups program. And it's it's a grant program where community groups and school groups can apply to receive free native plants for different projects that they're doing. And we started this program back in, I believe, 2016. Um, we have two grant cycles. Uh, the one that's connected with Plant Dane is the spring cycle. So people can, groups can apply for native plants in December and January, and then um, we let them know if we accepted their, their application in February, and we post those projects on the Plant Dane site. So for those people who are ordering plants, they can then also select a project to donate to. It's a really, it's been a really great way to get native plants to, to these, these school and community groups. And again, the donation period, so you can donate through through March 21st as well. It, it coincides with the planting order period. There is also another uh, fall summer fall cycle where those plants are actually provided um, through the growers program that we talked a little bit about. So people doing the milk jug method and growing their own plants, they are also growing plants for uh, for these projects as well. And those are available through the, the summer and fall cycle. And we are now, if you know any groups that are interested, uh, we're accepting applications for our summer and fall cycle um, and through July 20th. And you can get that on our website. We also, we talked about the growers program and then um, this, this workshop in particular is is part of our plant dane effort our plant dane program so obviously every year we run a workshop like this sometimes in person but now virtual so that's all part of plant dane so this is uh you know the end of our workshop the end of class three we've given you an assignment after each class and and this is class or this is assignment number three so kind of the, uh, you know, wrapping everything up, everything that you've learned and taking now your, your site, you know, first you, you looked at your site location, where is a good spot for a rain garden. You measure your roof, your um, runoff coming off your roof or your roof area. So we can measure that roof runoff. Class two, you actually created kind of a site plan and a simple design, thought a little bit about the plants you might want to use. We asked you to, kind of think about two or three plants you might want to include. And then now um, we're moving on to the actual planting plan. So obviously today was all about plants. You learned all kinds of information about plants and we have so many resources available for you on that Google Drive. So please take a good look at that. Uh, there's There are planting plans that you can use. Um, you know, you can just take those and, and run with them uh, or you can kind of create your own. So we have a, a worksheet that, that we, created for assignment three that kind of was walking you through through all the steps of, you know, all the different design considerations that Emily and Maddie have kind of walked you through so that you can start to develop your own planting plan and a list of plants. So once you go through that worksheet, you're going to create a create a table like this. Um, so this is mine. And again, it's just building off that site plan from assignment two down here. Uh, this is my final plant design. This is Teresa's, which is so nice. <laughs> Again, you know, she's much more tech savvy than I am, but back to basics down here. Uh, so, you know, after going through that worksheet, I started thinking about all the plants that I might want, my site conditions, and this was the list of plants I came up with. So again, taking into account everything Maddie said, where, you know, and, and Emily, um, bloom times and soil moisture and, and different, you know, making sure you have a diverse uh, set of plants there. Uh, color is a really big important thing to, to keep in mind too. You want little pops of color here and there, and then heights. And, you know, again, what are those expectations you have for that rain garden? So this was, this was the plan that I came up with. This was my list of plants that I came up with. And after kind of thinking about it more, I was, like, oh, there's a, there's a lot here. And uh, I only have the, the rain garden that I might, my second rain garden that I'm kind of designing now is about 80 square feet. And I, um, again, looking back at that kind of six inches um, to one, you know, to one foot, one plant per, per one square foot or a little bit less. Um, these are the, these are the plants that I came up with. And then I, you know, I kind of looked at it and said, oh, you know, I, this is quite a list. I think I want to narrow it down a little bit, and that's why I crossed them off. It was quite the process, right? Uh, and please use your your tools that you have. I mean, one of the main tools I have or that I that I used a lot was the Prairie New 
Prairie Moon website, um, it, it does have a really good search feature where you can say, oh, well, I'm looking for, you know, a yellow plant that blooms in July and is only this tall. And all of a sudden these things popped up. Um, so it, again, those are really great resources when you're going through this. And then I kind of color coded it a little bit where the green shaded areas or shaded species here are plants that are available through plantain. So, you know, you probably won't find everything that you want uh, on plantain, but you'll probably find some things on plantain. And I am by no means pushing plantain. Dane County doesn't make any money on plantain. It's just a way to get native plants out. So, um, you know, get what you can and then find other sources for, for other native plants. So I kind of had a combination of, of um, some that were available through Plant Dane and some that weren't. And, and this is what I came up with. And um, I like to kind of color coat mine a little bit and, um, you know, a little rainbow here that I have. So uh, I also included just the line where, you know, is kind of the bottom of my basin and kind of that sloped area, just so I know where everything kind of fits and where it's going. And that's also something to, obviously to consider here when you're when you're choosing your species. Um, make sure you have a little bit of both. Uh, and that, that worksheet I'm talking about will kind of walk you through that whole process. And then at the end, you kind of do that check of like, do I have everything that I need? Um, is this meeting, meeting my expectations? What does it look like? So hopefully you're gonna come up with something that looks like this or Again, if you're much more tech savvy, something that looks like this um, up here, <laughs> what, what Teresa came up with. A couple options, but both will work. So this is ultimately, hopefully what you can, can come up with if, if, um, if you go ahead and complete assignment three. And I just wanted to leave you with um, just some inspiration. You've seen some of these photos before, uh, but just some rain garden designs and some, some rain gardens throughout our area here in Dane County. And I also just wanted to take the opportunity to thank everybody for, especially the presenters, um, for taking the time out for three, three days, three nights um, out of their, you know, out of their schedule to, to lead us through this because uh, they, they are a wealth of knowledge, and I think you all know that by now. So, um, and also for kind of helping me uh, through the Padlet submissions and feedback and all that. So thank you, thank you presenters. We really, really appreciate you. Um, and thank you to all who took the time out to actually come in and join us for an hour and a half, you know, for the past, I don't know, six, four weeks? Four weeks, every two weeks, I guess we had a class. Um, I, you know, I had a great time and, and I, every time I go through this workshop, it's, a, well, it's a little different, obviously virtual or in person. And I always learn so much too. So, you know, I, I think even the presenters probably learned, learned a little bit from the other presenters. So, and I, I, I love seeing the comments in the chat because um, I know some of you are, are really plant experts that are in that, are in, in this prison or in the, um, in the workshop. So I hope you all got something out of it. And again, we really appreciate you kind of, taking the time and spending it with us to learn a little bit more about rain gardens. And hopefully we've given you the tools to, to put in your rain garden and uh, motivation to do so as well. Um, I will say, so you can, we are gonna keep the Padlet open uh, for another couple weeks. So please submit any questions or, you know, final design plans um, to the Padlet. Again, I added another column for, for class three and any questions related to class three. I think at this point we, have gotten back to most of you, uh, it was mostly today, but I think most of you have answers to your questions or possibly follow-up questions that we'd like answers to to help you. Um, but we're gonna keep it open probably for another couple weeks after this class. Uh, and then again, we'll be providing feedback for those couple weeks. And after that, I think the Padlet is, is gonna stick around as a resource, uh, but we won't actively be monitoring the Padlet. That said, you know, as you get into this, and especially those of you that really don't didn't know your soils and weren't able to, you know, go through the whole design process, that's okay. Um, you know, maybe you'll pick up these resources later and have an opportunity to to use them. And if you have questions, um, you have all our contact information on that Google Drive. Please, you know, reach out and, and ask us. Um, we'd be happy to help. I'm gonna, um, and then I. Right after this, right after we complete um, this last class, I do have a survey that I, I would love you to um, to respond to. 
I'm not sure if it's going to open right now for me or not, uh, but it's just on SurveyMonkey. I think it's 10 or 11 questions. And, you know, we really try to improve this workshop every, you know, from year to year. And again, this was our first virtual workshop. And I know we had some, me in particular, had some tech, technical issues or, you know, issues with technology. Um, but um, we'd really like some feedback on, on, you know, how you think it went. Did we cover the things that you were expecting to cover? Um, you know, what are some additional questions you might have? So if you wouldn't mind taking the time to actually fill out this survey, um, we'd really appreciate it. And I will send the link right after, right after we end this, uh, end this workshop, I will send the link with, uh, or the survey link. So with that, with that, I'm going to stop sharing my screen. And Janice, we still have some homes for sale in Dane County. So anytime you wanna move up here, um, there's even some that don't have rain gardens yet. <laughs> so we're at about 738. If, if there's anybody that has any questions right now or wants to share anything, um, I think hopefully the presenters will, will stick around maybe for another 10 to 15 minutes. Um, you know, I'm just going to open it up to all of you. I'm also going to put um, a link to the survey in the chat. There you go. Any questions? Any comments, presenters? Did we, did I miss anything? Did we miss anything? Great job tonight. Uh, I'm, I'm always jealous of the people who get to talk on the last night because they get to talk about all the fun plants. <laughs> Thanks for doing the hard work, Teresa. <laughs> Crystal, Emily and I get the fun job. I did want to share one book that I just got. Uh, I'll grab it one second. This is my new favorite book. Oh, of course it's backwards. It's Pollinators of Native Plants um, by Heather Holm. So if you have an interest in, I'm sorry that it's backwards, um, an interest in native plants and pollinators, um, this book is amazing. It goes through and breaks it down by native plants and tells you exactly which pollinators are using which plants, which is, to me, something I've always wanted to get my hands on. Um, and it will also just teach you a lot about native plants in our area. So it's a really fun one. I'll type the name into the chat box here, too. I just got that book, too, Maddie. <laughs> Thanks, Maddie. All right. Well, again, thanks all for coming and we'll let you go. Carry on with your evening. But um, for those of you that have any questions or want to stick around, uh, we'll stick around for maybe another 10 minutes. Thanks, everybody. Thank you so much.